ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends, colleagues, welcome to the March uh, edition of the Director's Lecture Series. Today we want to look at the repatriation of artifacts, the debates and issues that, that take place there. Uh, in February of this year, priceless collection of Cambodian gold jewelry was returned to Cambodia. It had been in possession of a London-based family of the late Douglas Latchford, who at his death in August 2020 was facing federal charges in the US for the key role he played in the looting and trafficking of Southeast Asian antiquities. Prestigious US institutions such as the Metropolitan Museum of, of, of Art, the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, and the Norton Simon Museum, to name just three, have returned artifacts to South and Southeast Asia in recent dec decades. And in last year, the Honeyman Museum in London returned six Benin bronzes taken by British troops from Benin City 125 years ago. It was the first time a UK government funded institution agreed to return cultural treasures that had been looted uh, around the world. The calls for the repatriation and restitution of art and artifacts have been growing stronger of the last decade or two, and they're becoming more heated and more complex. They're challenging questions around the morality of keeping looted items that have significant cultural value to the nations from which they have been stolen. And these debates about established global museums serves as places to showcase global art and artifacts. Will returning these artifacts be lost to the global community? And how do we prevent that? Those are the issues that we're going to be looking at today. And in a sense, we've asked two uh, very esteemed colleagues to help us in this regard. Uh, the art historian and curator, Professor Naman Ahuja from JNU in Delhi, and Dr. Stephen Murphy, the Patitia Paul, Senior Lecturer in Curating and Museology of Asian Art in SOAS at the University of London. Um, let me say a little about my two colleagues. Naman Ahuja is a professor of art history at JNU, as I've said, but he's also the Dean of the School of Art and Aesthetics. He's the general editor of MARG, India's oldest publishing house dedicated to art and culture. As a writer and curator, uh, Naman's work has deepened our understanding of Indian art from the perspectives of visual culture, aesthetics, iconography, and transculturalism. His books have been translated in French, Spanish, and Dutch. He has curated some of the most important exhibitions of Indian art in the past 10 years, including The Body in Indian Art and Thought, which was shown in Brussels in the National Museum in Delhi in 2013, and India and the world in which 120 objects from the British Museum were staged in strategic dialogue with Indian objects uh, in the CSMVS in Mumbai and the National Museum in Delhi. The exhibitions have received critical acclaim for generating narratives of Indian history within a globalized world cognizant of issues of caste, gender, comparative religion, and of course, decolonization. Dr. Stephen Murphy, uh, as I said, was the Paditya Paul, Senior Lecturer in Curating and Museology at SOAS. Uh, Stephen specializes in art and archeology span of Buddhism and Hinduism in the first millennium in CE Southeast Asia with a particular focus on Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar. He also concentrates on maritime trade and connections between Southeast Asian cultures, Tang China, and the Indian Ocean world in general. His museological focus engages with methods of curating Asian art in the context of colonialism and post-colonial studies and debates surrounding the decolonizing of museums. What I'm going to do, colleagues, is allow both Naman and Stephen about 10 minutes each for making introductory comments and thereafter, uh, we'll start the conversation that needs to happen. Uh, so, Naman, uh, once again, to both of you, thank you for making yourselves available 
Naman, I know it's very, very late in Delhi. Thank you for staying up and for being party to this conversation. Naman, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Adam. It's, it's very nice of you to have sent me this invitation and I'm happy to be a part of this discussion because it's um, a subject I've been thinking about for some years from different perspectives. And my starting point this evening is not whether repatriation should or should not happen, or if it is a good thing or not. The demand for the repatriation of objects to source countries is only increasing. And this year it's on the G20s discussions and India has introduced culture and repatriation as a part of the agenda. So repatriation is only going to increase in pace. That is a given. Now, what I'm interested in is that along with that come lots of other expectations, which should take us back to the drawing board to discuss why we are repatriating things in the first place. What are the expectations of the repatriated object? Who selects which object should be repatriated or be prioritized for repatriation? What are the duties of, re of the repatriating agency or country? And what are the new responsibilities of the home of the repatriated object? Who will hold these different parties to account if they are found to be derelict in their duties towards these objects? Now, before we go into a discussion on brainstorming on what would be the most ethical way forward, I think we also need to outline why we are asking for the repatriation and why has this demand intensified now? Repatriation of objects, relics, museum artifacts is seen by many as a way to right either the problem of looting of objects in source countries or as a way to right a historical injustice such as Nazi looting or colonization. But I'm afraid one shoe does not fit all those needs. The place from which the object was taken is no longer the same place to which it is being returned. The political map has radically altered over the decades and even centuries since the object has been dislodged. Are those people or even the descendants of those people still the ones asking for the return? Each case for repatriation will have to be assessed differently. Who by? Who is the assessing authority? The media? One of the reasons why we are seeing a rise in the demand for the return of cultural patrimony is because of growing globalization and because of the threat communities face of losing their culture. Racism and economic inequalities have precipitated this. However, the question we need to ask is whether the return of the object in question is in a museum is going to fix this problem. What is being repatriated is therefore being done as a symbolic gesture. It cannot right the wrongs of history. Repatriation of an object is just too little to ask for and expect those generations of poverty and deep civilizational scars to be wiped off by that symbolic gesture. So if repatriation isn't enough, what is? And I'll return to this question shortly because I think that's the more important question. First, and equally importantly, we also have to look at the limits of the buzzword these days, decolonization, from another perspective. Not all the ills that our world faces, not all, many, but not all the ills that our world faces can be laid at the door of, colon of colonialism or of colonization. So don't imagine that decolonization is going to fix all those ills. The inequities of caste and gender in India are not a gift of colonialism alone. So why do we imagine that the word decolonization of which repatriation is a part is going to fix this? I believe this narrative of repatriation is being used as a gesture or as a ruse to allow the media to have some hot public stories rather than make a difference to the substantive issues at hand, which at least from an art historian's point of view are far more urgent. We, as art historians, I think, come from a position where we believe in the protection and safety of objects. And for that, we house them in museums if they can no longer be housed or preserved in the site from which they come. Now, many seem to have made up their mind that objects are being looted from sites for the sake of the art market 
This, I'm afraid, is only partially true. The truth is that the desire for the possession of art objects is no longer the main driving force for the desecration or the pillaging of ancient sites. The reasons, in fact, are twofold, and they are uncomfortable. First, it is because of utter negligence. Few monuments are protected well in the countries from which these artifacts come. Most of these ancient ruins lie unprotected, and now the chokidars or the security personnel at these sites, what to speak of art historians and archaeologists, don't even get their monthly wage on time. The sites are being looted as a result, and this will not stop if you repatriate a few objects from the West to India. The second threat to archaeological sites is the advance of man. Urbanization, the cutting down of forests, the construction of metros, dams, smart cities, and expanding agriculture, South Asia, at least, is, is encountering a pace of development never seen before in its history. More parts of India are being urbanized, more power projects are being constructed, industrialization, ever-expanding suburbs. As the population increases and more rural areas and hinterlands are converted into urban spaces, archaeological contexts are going to be disturbed forever. And most often, no developer, even if it is the government, which is supposed to be the caretaker of heritage, ever reports the discovery of artifacts for fear that archaeologists may slow, slow down or even stop the development work. I mean, the absence of any reported antiquities during the construction of the Delhi Metro, where I'm sitting, is a prime example of such silence and apathy. Whereas all other major historic cities like Paris, Rome, and London, they use the opportunity of their metro development or their underground development to create museums filled with pottery, coins, and artifacts found during those excavations. We've been led to believe in Delhi that nothing was found while digging in the shadow of the Qutub Minar or in Tughlaqabad or in Chandni Chowk in Shah Jahanabad. Nothing was found, apparently. Opportunities are being lost. Objects are being lost. Should we therefore be living in the hope and prayer that some intrepid private art dealer should rescue them for us? if the government isn't rescuing them. Um, because who is it that we want to blame? If the reason for the repatriation is to seek public accountability for the removal of artifacts from a place without the consent of its people, then we need to assess if repatriating it will now address those requirements, the real requirements why we are repatriating. We shouldn't lose sight of that. The repatriation of, of objects is not possible without detailed studies on provenance. So who is training these provenance historians and where? Are our universities building up their capacity to be able to start training people in these fields? Which are the courses? Who is developing? Secondly, the place to which the object is being repatriated must demonstrate the capacity to look after its cultural assets and mobilize them in lively public displays. Now, this, this is a matter that is dependent on the caliber and training of the personnel that work in heritage and museums. Our countries like India, Nepal, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Myanmar, and Sri Lanka, if I look only at my own surroundings, investing adequately in the education of art historians, curators, archaeologists, and the institutions that they are meant to run, in order to be able to look after this rich cultural patrimony. The quantum rise in heritage and archives needs much larger investment and deployment of resources. And this flip side is not being discussed currently, adequately. One major aspect of the problem is that perhaps we are expecting far too much of our museums and archeology span departments in India and the rest of the South Asian region. Perhaps it's just too much cultural patrimony for them to control. Like most cultures that were vulnerable and subjected to massive looting, stringent laws were enacted to stem the export of antiquities by these countries. The onus, therefore, now lies on the state in these countries to protect all heritage. However, at the pace at which our heritage is being affected by development, its protection seems well beyond the coping capacity of the state. So there's little choice but to widen the support base by increasing the stakeholders in the preservation of heritage. And who better to do it than the people themselves, whose heritage it is. But how is that to be done? 
again, we come back to the university to perform an ennobling role of getting the people invested in the field. Repatriating countries need to send back. This is my other thing. It's not enough to send back the object, but also help the source countries in developing the infrastructure they need. The major question then is that if the government has to take recourse to creating frameworks for guiding international collaborations in capacity building, knowledge sharing, and even nowadays in a post-liberalized world, the privatizing aspects of museum and heritage management, which is what we are seeing all around us, what does this privatization mean for the long-term security of heritage? What will be the guiding principles by which public-private ownerships of heritage will be regulated? I feel these are the more urgent questions that um, we need to address, which come with uh, as a concomitant responsibility alongside repatriation. And I think those people who work in policy really need to be able to start thinking about these matters alongside and not just leave it at the return of the object and using that as a mediatized photo op for both parties. So I'll, I'll end my initial comments here. I have a whole bunch of other things to talk about, but perhaps later during the conversation. Thank you, Norman. I think that those are important points. I'll come back to that and summarize some of it in a minute, but I am going to switch immediately to Stephen and ask Stephen to make his introductory remarks, and then perhaps we can open up the conversation. Stephen, great, the floor yeah, yours. thank you. And um, yeah, I just have a few slides to go with this. Um, so yeah, firstly, uh, thank you to uh, uh, to Professor Adam, Adam Habib, of course, and uh, for inviting me to participate in this. And also, sorry, I'm just going to time myself. All right, and also to um, yeah, Dr. Name and Ayuha as well. It's a it's a real honor and a privilege to be uh, presenting alongside him. Um, I'd like to start with a teaching anecdote. Last week during a first year undergraduate module that I convened, uh, my colleague Malcolm McNeil carried out a brainstorming exercise with the students. He asked them to come up with words they associate with the museum. Uh, perhaps you were thinking that the students responded with terms such as art, culture, history, preservation, collections or even education. Um, instead, the first word often offered by a student was stolen. And I'm gonna move. Yeah, um, this was a sobering illustration of how the public perception and discourse surrounding museums has shifted significant, significantly over the past decade in particular. Uh, see, for instance, the article that just came out today uh, in The Guardian uh, involving uh, the Metropolitan Museum and Nepalese material and this uh, next slide by um, Project Brazen, um, who incidentally described themselves as a global journalism studio and production company. Uh, this is a screenshot from one of their podcasts, Dynamite Doug, about the late Douglas Latchford, who at his death in August 2020 was facing federal charges in the US uh, for his key role that he played in the looting and trafficking of Southeast Asian antiquities. Um, so in the 10 minutes allotted to me, I'd like to explore this issue in more depth. Um, whether it be due to social media, forms of activism, the media itself, uh, or prevailing post-colonial and decolonial par paradigms uh, within academia, museums can no longer ignore the sea change. So it le leads me to ask, what can and should museums be doing to address this? Uh, to answer this further, uh, I will focus on Southeast Asia, the area that I specialize in. Um, for the past decade or so, Southeast Asia has been the site of many repatriation claims, uh, some successful, some not, some still ongoing. I will attempt to tease out some of the key issues um, from these that are, uh, and I argue, that need deeper consideration and critical reflection. Uh, to give you just a few examples of the returns that have been taking place within, uh, without going into specifics, uh, these are the Kalkair statues uh, from 2014 ongoing from uh, Cambodia, from major US museums, such as the Met, the Norton Simon, Cleveland Museum of Art, Denver Art Museum, um, so on and so forth. These are two lintels that were returned recently uh, to Thailand from Asian Art Museum, San Francisco. Uh, this is a return of Deepa Nagaro's Chris, it's a ceremonial sword or dagger, uh, from the Museum of Ethnology, Leiden, the Netherlands, to Indonesia in March, 2020. 
And as Adam said in his introduction, um, this is the return of the Khmer Gold of Douglas Latchford. And this collection was based in London. Uh, I'd like to start by pointing out that repatriation and restitution debates and processes take place at a variety of spaces and on a variety of registers. Uh, many take place within various bounded spaces. Uh, national frameworks, minis ministries of cultures. Uh, Naman just referred to the uh, the G20. That's that's interesting. I wasn't aware of that. Um, cultural and institutional frameworks, of course, such as museums, uh, legal bodies. There's law enforcement are involved. That would be Department of uh, Homeland Security in the states, for example. NGOs such as the Antiquities Co Coalition, academia, the space that the three of us are situated within heritage movements and grassroots activism, um, by, be it blog sites uh, such as Chasing Aphrodite or Dynamite Doug, and of course established broadsheets such as The Guardian, uh, The Times and so forth in the UK or the New York Times in the United States. Um, this is the first issue I'd like to identify. Restitution processes and discourses contain many moving parts, not all of them pulling in the same direction. In fact, many can often be in opposition to each other, I would like to ask us to think about how we can start to move towards a critical reflection and analysis of these various spaces and movements. Obviously, collaboration, which was mentioned earlier, um, interdisciplin and interdisciplinarity are key. In doing so, can we add nuance to the many binaries that are projected onto these processes? Uh, what tensions and points of contestation can arise? Uh, perhaps more importantly, in the context that I am discussing, what role can Southeast Asian epistemologies um, or, or forms of knowledge play? Can we shift the lens to one that privileges local forms of Southeast Asian knowledge? Um, for my part, I am attempting to tackle this uh, through a research project I'm currently involved with um, called Circumambulating Objects on Paradigms of Restitution of Southeast Asian Art, or Co-op for short. It's a Getty Foundation Connecting Art Histories grant. I'm currently the co-investigator on this with my colleague, Professor Ashley Thompson, who is the principal investigator. Um, one of the aims of co-op is to provide a space for these interactions to happen. Through a series of in-region workshops, it will provide an opportunity for participants, many of whom are Southeast Asian, to step outside our silos and to a certain extent our comfort zones so that we can, as we state on our website, approach restitution processes in the region today in a manner that is at once locally meaningful and globally aware. And like I said previously, interdisciplinarity is, is key. Um, the second issue I'd like to identify, and, and Naman has touched on it already, um, is what happens after restitution. Uh, once the politicians have capitalized on their carefully choreographed photo shoots and the media spotlight has been switched off, what happens next? Um, Sorry. Yeah, uh, this slide shows you one such event that happened just last Friday. It is the return of the aforementioned, aforementioned gold and a number of other key sculptures to Cambodia. But I think as Naman has well illustrated, restitution is not an end in itself. Um, oftentimes the objects do not go back to their original context, be they the temple, palace, archaeological site, or local community from which they were originally plundered. Instead, new homes need to be made for them, uh, more often than not a national museum in the capital, often far from the original um, fine spots in local communities, or they can be brought to well-managed archeological sites or site museums in the vicinity of original fine spots, but still not placed back in situ. What challenges does this process bring to the surface? Um, and don't get me wrong here, I'm not using this issue as an argument against repatriation and restitution which is a common tactic deployed by the opponents of it. Quite the opposite, um, restitution brings unique possibilities and opportunities. Uh, but in order to capitalize on them, we need to think beyond the traditional responses. Instead of placing them um, within museums where more often than not, they are slotted back into neat art historical chron chronologies, oftentimes the products of colonial knowledge, and that say little to nothing about the restitution histories of the object. Can we not instead use these objects to, to begin to explore more human narratives and local epistemologies? Um, the Cambodians, for instance, say that the statues represent the soul of the nation. Yesterday, the Phnom Penh Post, in its reporting of the aforementioned ceremony on Friday the 17th, finishes its piece with a quote from the Ministry of Culture. 
of fine arts as follows, quote, may the souls of the Cambodian ancestors who returned to their homeland help to bring the kingdom of Cambodia peace, prosperity, and harmony forever, end quote. This emotive connection transcends any dry historical narratives represented in museum labels. Um, how then do we start to integrate these stories into museum displays, as well as the more painful histories of violence wrought by colonial and neo-colonial entanglement? What type of new narratives could be created from these returns within the museum, gallery, archaeological site, temple, local village space, etc.? This is the challenge, but also the opportunity that restitution of objects affords. Um, and just to finish, one answer may, may lie in an event that took place just over two weeks ago. On October 28, renowned uh, Cambodian dancer Sokolin Chem Shapiro performed an unsanctioned dance in the Southeast Asian galleries of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York to honor Cambodia's stolen heritage. She said, quote, for us, the statues are spiritual and belong back in Cambodia, end quote. This simple, graceful, but powerful act immediately collapsed the artificial boundaries museums create between secular and sacred space. It reminds us that there are multiple ways to interact with objects, many of which grounded in local epistemologies and practice transcend the obsessive Western cult of ocular centricism, the privileging of vision over all other senses. This intervention was eventually brought to a halt by a museum security guard who in a disapproving tone, tone tell, telling the instructor Superline to put her shoes back on, saying, you can't walk around barefoot. Read into this what you may. And circling back to my opening anecdote, what of museums in the West and the popular perception today, justified or otherwise, that they are objects of stolen, or they are locations of stolen objects? If they wish to counter this narrative, then instead of spending their money on lawyering up and stonewalling researchers and government officials, they could alternatively put it into more positive use by genuinely engaging with sort com uh, countries and communities. In fact, those that have done so, such as the Cleveland Museum of Art, have been able to build meaningful relationships with Cambodia over the past five years, working on a number of collaborative projects and exhibitions. Others have chosen to be opaque and to obfuscate, and in doing so are reinforcing, reinforcing prevailing uh, public perceptions that they are, they are locations of stolen art or loot. Um, the course of action for me seems clear. Museums can be a very meaningful and wel welcome part of the solution, or as the saying goes, they can remain very much part of the problem. The choice really is theirs. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, so colleagues, I think we've got uh, two very, very useful uh, introductory statements that I want to start off with question uh, number one, in, in many ways, the substance of this debate. In many ways, what strikes me about the debate sitting in London now, but having come from South Africa, is how polarized and unnuanced this conversation is. And what you see is some people on the right of the political spectrum saying these things should not be returned because they can't be cared for, or you're taking away what is the collective history of, of, the, you know, uh, of, of the world community. And then you have a whole series of others, activists in the left, liberal intellectuals, who are saying return this, uh, in an, often in very unqualified formulations. Now, let me give you the dilemma that happens in a place like South Africa. Most of South Africa's public, universe, uh, public uh, museums are not appropriately supported much of what Naman said actually exists in South Africa. In fact, I think the situation in South Africa is even worse. They actually disintegrating before our eyes. Go to the Johannesburg Art Museum or go to many other places uh, in many of the smaller towns in South Africa. And so if you return, the, uh, the object will either be destroyed or lost or hand up in private hands. Now, the answer is not to take the position to say, don't return. If you understood South Africa well enough, you could say that South Africa's universities run very good museums and they have a real appreciation. So it's not not returning, but who do you return to? Right. And the second question that Naman posed was, with what qualifications? With how do you enable capacity? With what resource base, et cetera? There's a second debate that took place earlier on in the earlier part of the century, 
were in, we were discussing the Timbuktu manuscripts in South Africa. And one of the big debates that Thabo Mbeki, then president of South Africa insisted, was he got the big mobile, te mobile technology company, MTN on the African continent, to underwrite the costs of an infrastructure to house some of the, the, the Timbuktu manuscripts. Timbuktu manuscript. The point I'm making is we can have a more complex debate and a more nuanced conversation. And I just don't think that that is happening in large parts of the West. It's become a polarized conversation because what they're interested in is the debate internally to their nations, as opposed to the broader global debate that needs to be understood. And I just wanted to get your thoughts, Naman. I know you touched on this, but I want to get your thoughts and then I want to get Stephen's thoughts. It's, it's one of the hardest aspects of this entire question. And I've been reading some of the questions that have been coming up in our Q&A box. And they are touching on the same thing, that somewhere the legality of the current ownership needs to also be held to account. That is the current place where they are kept, really the rightful place. Let's go with the argument for a moment that it is not. And then comes your case. Well, well then what is, which I was saying, what is? Um, the return to an equally illegal owner does not right a wrong. Who do we regard as the rightful owner? Um, this was such a complex debate and it's so tricky. Laws to protect antiquities are imposed by nation states, but what happens when the government suddenly changes to a different political persuasion and the nation as previously defined ceases to exist? Come on, we work at SOAS and JNU. I mean, we, we, we debate these issues in our classes all the time. We're not raising an academic matter here. Yeah. If the museum is subjected to shifting ideological whims, it stands to ignore the culture of those who are now in the minority. These matters get magnified in times of war and conflict. Um, in the case of Tibet in 1959, the exodus that accompanied the Dalai Lama to India was followed by a shift in their movable cultural heritage. So icons, tankas, cultures that went with the performance of rituals which were necessary for their cultural identity and functioning were relocated to wherever the community went. Terrible atrocities we know were perpetrated on what was left behind in Tibet and untold quantities of artifacts made their way to the international art market via China, Hong Kong, Kathmandu, Bangkok. These are precarious, the precarious conditions in source countries have led to the redeployments of their artifacts for reasons other than looting alone. So don't imagine that looting for the sake of filling the museums in the West was the only reason why the objects left those places in the first, in, in, at the first instance. Or development, as I've said, is an equally pernicious thing. Afghanistan currently, I don't need to even go into the matter. Would you feel comfortable repatriating to China uh, the objects that come from Tibet, which the Tibetans fled with? Would you feel that it is morally right for us to be able to repatriate to the Taliban currently, which does not wish to, or you know, in so many other countries? So that is a reality that we have to actually deal with, but there are fantastic Gandharan objects. Are we going to be uh, doing right by the objects by sending them back to those places? So I think a much bigger question hangs in the balance. Does heritage belong to the land from which it comes or to the people who love it? That's the ultimate question that we are going to come. You know, I mean, the precise fate of what's happening in, around India may not be our position in India. Um, however, I mean, there's another aspect to all of this. There are many Indians who live in diaspora who similarly have a claim to their heritage in the US, Singapore, UK, Canada, or wherever they, they, they now reside. And in turn, their governments have to be seen as being inclusive and showcase the heritage of those communities in their public museums also. Now, in the past few decades, redefining a national project has become necessary in a world where families and identities of people are diasporic and hyphenated. And you are Indian while you are simultaneously something else. Um, so will the something else, those parts of the world, be respectful of your Indian identity and showcase it as their national identity in their museums or not? 
or are you always going to sequester yourself and become excluded from the community or the land in which you now live? Um, these are very serious questions, and therefore, I'm not. I'm not. This is in no way trying to. Uh, this should not be misunderstood in any way as supporting the mass looting or egregious theft or decontextualization of artifacts. Far from it. But I'm just saying that there has to be a very calibrated case by case basis. And then you've got a very shifting uh, benchmark. You see, at some point, the law got so complex that UNESCO decided we'll take 1972 as the cutoff point. And we'll say that anything that came after 1972 is going to be regarded as illegal and subjected to different checks. That doesn't make the objects that came before 1972 perfectly kosher. And now yeah. the ICJ has said that Nazi material that was Nazi loot from the Second World War is fair to be returned. So you've taken the benchmark further back now. How far back are you planning to take these historical wrongs? Um, because if you keep going back, there will always be an aggrieved or an injured historical party, which can be an 18th century community that was aggrieved or um, which was uh, deprived of their artifacts, or it might be a 20th century community, or it might even go back to the 11th or 12th century. What are you going to do? Is it okay to keep... Um, um, you know, expecting repatriation on the so basis the, of historical so wrong. Effectively, well, effectively, what you're saying is the world evolves, societies evolve, nations uh, exist, and sometimes they exist and sometimes they don't. I like that. Sometimes they don't. And so I think it's the people who can demonstrate that they are going to look after the objects because the objects are what we are interested in preserving so that they can tell their narrative and their rich stories for every generation. Let the object not be in peril so that it goes to a condition where the object cannot tell its story of its looting, even on the story of its looting for the next generation. But can I ask you a question? If you say it goes to a, a people who are prepared to care for it, to look after yes. it, to preserve it, in a world of inequality, there yes. are some people who are advantaged and have the resources to do so, and other people who don't. And so what are you saying? Are you saying, is it okay for these, for these objects to remain in the West? Or are you saying that elites in the South have to put some skin in the game? They got to, if you like, ensure that they make commitments to the preservation of these objects. And it's not that they are not willing to do so, Adam, but I think they have to be enabled to do so because currently there is an overweening power of the state that takes control over these matters to such an extent that, you know, it's not just the elites. I have to put a correction there. I know of very intrepid poor people who have in their fields found fascinating and really interesting objects. And they're not dim by any yardstick and they know that these are valuable things and they could have an interest in, in history and in heritage protection. And some of them were even keen to try and with their meager resources, open up a little museum on their own location. But they, they, have, they have, some of them have been so threatened by the instruments of the state that have come and seized their artifacts compulsorily or told them that what they were housing was illegal and they didn't have a license or a permit to do so. And all the, you know, such thing that they got so petrified by the powers of the state that that local level um, involvement in heritage is being stymied at some point. I forget about the, I've written previously articles about how we need to make it easier for uh, intrepid Indian businessmen who have deep pockets to buy back and bring heritage back to India if it's going up for sale, coming up for sale in the West or something, and how customs regulations and laws need to be eased to be able to and not have, and those things have been modified. Um, so it's not that there isn't any government change. If governments are listening, but I think we also need to think about empowering local museums at some at some point. Can I bring Stephen here? Stephen, do you want to come in and give me yeah. your thoughts on these issues? Yeah, actually, I think, you know, you know, we were talking about binaries, and, and I think this is one of the major binaries between local and government, right? And uh, when we see these debates play out, uh, 
um, we see sort of national narratives. And of course, like these restitution debates get co-opted, you know, for political means, as politicians are wont to do. But I mean, I, I think we need to be careful here, though, as well, is that there's a the the Cambodian example I showed was really to try and try and emphasize that, you know, we can move beyond the the national and, and how it is still um, from on a local level, on a spiritual level, these objects are extremely meaningful. And um, so if we if we keep hammering on about about national level and national politics, we're going to miss um, the real opportunity and the real value of these restitutions. Um, so I think we have to make that really clear that that um, that there that you know we we need to start trying to address the local level and and yeah we need support and capacity building. But I think as well another point I'd like you know I get I get you know this is a this debate goes around and around and around again. Of course you know modern nation states may have different geographical boundaries to um, you know a thousand years ago when the objects were, were looted and, and where do you restitute it to and under which jurisdiction but I think you know if I look at the Thai example of, of two lintels that were returned from Asian Art Museum San Francisco in February uh, 2021 these are um, lintels from temples that are still extant uh, in northeast Thailand so when these objects were sent back they spent three months at the National Museum in Bangkok where the curator did an exhibition explaining to the public how difficult it was to restitute these objects. And so they had a really, it was a really good way of, of, um, of trying to get local awareness around restitution and using the objects in, in that positive way. After that, they were sent back to museums in close proximity to these um, archaeological sites. So, you know, I think it's really important to, you know, when we have objects that actually speak to the monument that's upstanding and you can understand the monument better by having that object in the muse site museum you know 10 meters away and um, surely we should you know that is a very meaningful use of that object we could argue it's much more meaningful um can you hear me okay yes we can yeah, uh, sorry um yeah um much more meaningful than, than having it in the museum in the west so i think we do need to to think of you know get beyond those sort of state level narratives in terms of, of what's meaningful. Um, can, can I ask a, a related question? Because it seems to me both Naman and you are raising this. And it really comes from a question that one of our audience has posed. Would we agree that looted artifacts today that are in a host country belong collectively to the populations of modern nation states demanding it? So basically what the question is being posed is it doesn't belong to the local temple that you're suggesting, Stephen. What this question is, it belongs to the collective uh, society of the modern nation state. In the case of India, the, uh, in the case of uh, that would be India or Cambodia or wherever. And what that means, the representative of that is the state itself. I'm gathering you questioning that, Stephen. Yeah, I mean, I think we maybe we have to we maybe we have this obsession with ownership as well. Um, so maybe we can say custodianship, um, right? You know, this is this is one of the museum tactics that, that they, well, we're just we're just custodians and stewards of this material. If that's the case, then why do you have laws like the 1963 British Museum Act that doesn't allow it back? Uh, that clearly states ownership. Um, but yeah, I think we need to get you know I want to get away from that 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 state level um yeah sort of binary of and you know obsession with ownership how, how about we have it as custodianship um and we find the most suitable place um for these objects to be um and my i think problem we, with, my problem with that and perhaps it's my where i come from my worry is you send it to the temple and the next morning somebody gets into the temple and walks away with the piece of course and, and yeah. what are the dangers of that so, I mean, you know, I think, again, this is where it becomes quite specific to which country you're looking at. And, and in Thailand now, that would be um, unlikely to happen. Um, in Cambodia, I think, within the national parks and national archaeological parks, that would be unlikely to happen. These are large objects as well. You know, you can't just come in and pick them up. You need coordinated looting, which actually happened in the 1960s and 70s. Um, 
when these objects were looted. Um, but today that would be very unlikely. So I think in the, in the Cambodian and the Thai case, I think that's not such a worry. Um, there's the sort of mechanisms in place. So I think we do have to be, you know, careful with those type of statements as well. Naman, can I bring you back to this question? Because you implicit in what you said, it also poses this question. Does, do the looted artifacts belong to the, to the collective population? Demanded well, from in my the mind, nation. it's not just the collective population, collective population of the current nation state. I think it needs to be wider. And I think it has been um, very well articulated. One of the good phrases that I've seen in the G20 lineup on the policy is that we call it global commons. And I think defining that global commons as to how that's going to be administered is, is an extremely important step that we need to open up and actually try and discuss. Because I think the stakeholders in cultural heritage are several, which is good. Checks and balances are needed on nation states as well. And um, well, we can't expect nation states to always do right by the objects. And so some kind of a condition of global commons and stewardship or custodianship, if they want to use those words, those are good words, actually. They're very noble words. But then let's define them. Let's define what stewardship no, and man, let me come back to you. No, but let me come back to you. There's another question here from someone in the audience. And they say, is repatriation not a question of social justice? Even if it is symbolic, don't you think it helps undo some of the colonial trauma? I think it happens? does. I think it does. And I think museums it's themselves as an institution as we have learned, have turned into spaces of transitional justice, as we call them, as a phrase that has now become quite common, uh, looking at South Africa's example. And I think it is, it is important in museum parlance to be able to see that. But I think the, the extent of these objects, what I'm coming down to is that somebody needs to quantify and say how much, which objects, and then what happens when they get to the source country? Will the, will the country from which they are being returned go every 18 months to survey the conservation requirements and see that they are being kept well? Will the curators from the receiving country be able to go to the country or to the museum where they were previously kept to learn how to preserve them and keep them, how to mobilize them for the public good? What kind of narratives are coming up with these objects came up then and are now going to be enabled? Um, because there are lots of ways of sharing uh, the knowledge and uh, coming up to this shared ownership of, but we need to start spelling out what will be the processes by which this will be done. Okay. And I think Let's universities just... have a role to play in this. Yeah. So, I mean, I think both of the, I think all of the issues you raise are useful. I want to come back to both of you on another question that somebody has asked and what he or she suggests is that the focus seems to be on museums mm -hmm. uh, to examine this issue and, and to examine how we act in them. But what about collections that are uh, in places outside museums, in private hands or in other areas? What do you think is their role and how should we think that through? Naman again to you and then I'll go to Stephen. It's a very difficult question, um, frankly. I find it one of the hardest questions to address. Most of our museums, as a person who works in museums, I know the reasons our museums are so rich and wonderful is because of the scholarship and intrepid nature of some private collector who actually went out, oftentimes against the, without any resources from the state backing them and went out and, put together extraordinary objects which were salvaged, sometimes looted. It's not always a clean story. There are both kinds of stories there. In the museums of India, were it not for many of the Maharajas who had started saving and collecting objects and rescuing them and building up their own little museum, they would never have been. There were intrepid people who started collecting brass utensils and silver and copper utensils which were not made out of the great stone monuments, but they had the wisdom to know that this was civilizationally important. And then musical instruments was another thing. The National Museum of India was never out collecting its 
history of musical historic instruments. There was one lady who was a who was a, a, a great musician, and she decided to build up a collection of these things. So I think there are many, many, the state is very often quite late to wake up and deploy the resources necessary to be able to protect and salvage the objects that are required for a library or for a museum, which some intrepid collector usually catches on to. Photography, popular art, print culture are extremely important cases in point. We keep talking about antiquities, great antiquities of South Asia and Southeast Asia, but if you wanted to tell a history of 20th century India, for instance, you wouldn't be able to tell it very well by going to the museums of India. Because the real history of what happened in the 20th century in India went into private hands and they connected it because the state was so busy collecting antiquities. So the lapses, the, 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 the lapses of the state have sometimes been filled by intrepid private collectors. And that needs to be archived and Needs, there needs to be a mechanism for that to enter the museum now, because those collectors can't look after them for posterity. You know, their, their descendants may not be interested. And so eventually these things do wind up over a few generations in the collections of museums. And the museums have to have collecting policies such that they are willing to receive these objects. Even what's your thoughts on this? Yeah. Um... Private collections, another, yeah, it's in, it's a it's a really good point that you raise and one that doesn't actually get discussed so much. Um, in terms of, yeah, I mean, I think the other thing we haven't talked about is is fakes and forgeries, and unfortunately, a lot of the time, um, collections can have quite quite bar large numbers of them. Um, a lot of the 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 issue, a lot of the cases that I've looked at or that I do look at in terms of the Southeast Asian context. I mean, if you look at the the way that the United States, the museum systems there work, a lot of a lot of the um, collections that museums like the Metropolitan Museum, Asian Art San Francisco, Art Institute Chicago, you name it, um, a lot of them come from private collectors. So there, a lot of them were founded. Asian Art San Francisco, for example, a lot of it was a lot of that collection was based on Avery Brundage. Um, but again, you know, the, then the collection is only as good as the collector, and um, that's why a lot of there's a lot of restitution claims now around Asian Art San Francisco because a lot of that collection, including the two lintels that were returned to Thailand, um, you know, were looted. So we have to be very careful when we when we um, when we think of it. I take Naman's point as uh, uh, that's the counterpoint. Yeah, of course, that um, sometimes you have collectors that will will amass collections that museum curators of the state don't think are important, but are actually historically very significant. Um, and so they can be of great value. So again, I think we really have to look on, on quite case by case basis. And actually what's happened in the United States now is, is the opposite in about, I think, 2008, um, when, um, when the, uh, the Museums Association eventually got strict on uh, collecting policies and provenance, um, Museums will now not accept donations from private collectors uh, without clear provenance. So now actually what you have is a lot of collectors um, who cannot actually donate their collections to the museum. So, so actually it's sort of, you're seeing a reversal in the States in terms of that. I would add that the late Douglas Latchford was very keen to um, place his collection in leading museums. And, you know, that would have been extremely problematic. Um, so we do have to be very careful when we think of, of private collectors. Um, okay, so I want to take two quick questions, which I think I cannot not take, given the fact that this is a university at after all. And the first is, you know, how do we get to re-examining the research that has been done uh, on objects when they have been in exile? It seems to me these objects are in a particular place and context matters, how you think through uh, the symbolic value of these objects and how you tell the stories associated with these objects is determined by the knowledge system in which you immersed in the contextual circumstances in which you emerge. And so the real interesting question that emerges is not simply the object itself, but what does the object say? What does it symbolize? The story behind the object. And what happens and how do you 
when the object is repatriated back to its country of origin or its land of origin, what about the research project there? How do we get back to the lost, um, the lost history? How do we get back to telling the stories that they should be understood? And can they be understood because these societies have evolved? And what is the role, if you like, of art historians, curators, and others in participating in such initiatives? I'll go with you, Stephen, and then I'll go to Naman. Great. Yeah, I think that's, again, a really important question. I think I, it's one thing I was trying to um, get to in, in the second part of my opening remarks is that, you know, that museums, museums are, you know, perfectly placed to actually, they're the ideal places to actually deal with this as well. And, you know, restitution is a transnational issue, right? By definition, it is because we have objects in, and and different parties in different parts of the world. And the way to, to really to, to deal with this is, is, is through collaboration. And um, there's been some positive examples. So for example, Cleveland Museum uh, about five years ago returned one of the statues to Cambodia uh, on their own initiative before the repatriation claim came in. And the Cambodians are quite, are quite savvy. They have this, what they call a win-win win-win policy where, where they wanna work with Western museums because they don't, not want their objects or their culture shown in a Western museum. They're quite happy for that, but it has to be under the right circumstances, right? It has to be. So basically what they have done with a number of museums is, is when an object is restituted, they actually loan a long-term loan back to that museum so that you can build collaboration. So with Cleveland Museum, they spent, they've done two, um, two exhibitions now where they, where both museums have collaborated and two um, very groundbreaking uh, exhibitions, and there's been a lot of knowledge sharing. So that is, I think, a, a, a really good example of how, you know, both parties can work together to tell the really important stories that need to be told. So I think, you know, that's my point, that museums need to take, in the West, need to start being proactive and start being much more open and start to work with um, the source communities as opposed to in opposition to them. So. Fantastic. Let me go to Naman. But Naman, before, I want you to answer a second question that is coming from somebody. And that is, how could you speak? How do we think through how we enable access to the cultural heritage that these objects represent, both to the diaspora and to the population from the country where the objects originate? We, we are a much more cosmopolitan global community. And many of the diaspora, you've spoken about this early on. How do we enable the access to both? And what, how can we think through a well, process that enables that? No I think we need to first ascertain that very often the kind of objects that we are looking at and are talking about, the first dibs on the best quality objects for instance, Japan has made it a policy to be able to do this, of every genre that they have are kept in the museums of Japan itself. And they have allowed the rest of the world's museums to be able to have everything else, as it were. Because, but if ever something comes up which is equivalent to a national treasure of extreme importance for Japan and for the Japanese identity and culture, the first example and the finest and most historically crucial example of that will lie in the, in the Japanese museum. Now, taking that as an example, we will find that the holdings of some of our museums in the West of South Asian artifacts, for instance, are so exhaustive. I mean, they are, they beggar belief, um, the quantity. So I don't think there is any question about the diaspora being deprived. And I don't think there is any question either about a requirement to repatriate. Both matters can be solved because the sheer quantity of objects that we are looking at is so vast. We're not talking about that one sculpture. And this is the sad thing as an art historian. I feel that the public debate on these issues has oftentimes been reduced to a few star pieces and to a few egregious looters and smugglers whose case studies seem to have 
uh, distorted our perception of the entire field of what collections enable, what private collect, what museums enable. I think cannot be marred or should not be just uh, destroyed because of a few really heinous acts um, that have taken place. And indeed, such acts need to be exposed. And then we can be talking more, more fruitfully about this shared knowledge building that we are talking about and uh, building this shared custodianship. So the example that um, Stuart gave of the Cleveland Museum of Arts investment in what they did was a long drawn out affair. Now, coming to this issue that you raised in the first question about the who's going to write those object biographies and those narratives and assess the actual ownership and the changing reception and meaning of an artwork. Very good question coming from an academician, because I can say to you, it takes us what? three to four years over a PhD at least to be able to get four or five object biographies put down properly in a single PhD. And the kind of research that is often required to chase one site, one object uh, down can take a long time sometimes. And so provenance research isn't easy. It's not just going to happen. It's going to mean, mean, mean a very significant shift in our departments and in our pedagogical emphases uh, for all of us to be able to give this its due. And it's gonna to have to be not just sitting in one university or two, but it's gonna to have to happen across the board in higher education, where we start giving object biographies and provenance research their space. So I, I know we're coming to the end of the conversation, and I'm gonna push the, the envelope and go for another five or 10 minutes. Uh, I have two questions. One, is really about uh, how objects are, if you like, manipulated by political agendas of one kind or the other, and how this becomes part of uh, an, a political agenda of, 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 of groups in different parts of the world. And, and what I want us, is there a problem about this? Should we be worried about this? Mm. Because the societies that we think of in the developing world are societies like Western societies, heterogeneous in multiplicity of ways. They constructed by power. They are element, they are groups that are marginalized, they are groups that are elite, that they reflect all of that. And the danger is that some groups in those societies can, if you like, use their power to enhance and use this debate for their own advantage and for their dominance as opposed to others. Is that something that we should worry about? I'll, I'll start at Stephen this time and then come to you, Naman. Stephen? Yeah, no, that's that's a, one of the, the stickier questions, right, with restitution, with re repatriation debates. Um, and one of one of the you know one of the arguments that's that's of, often cited for for not restituting, I think it is it is a it is a danger, and we have to really be aware of it. Um, I think sometimes archaeologists, in particular, maybe can can um, can sometimes lose sight of it, and you know, in in our quite objective frameworks where we we say, well, we're just producing histories and producing knowledge uh, for the greater good of society, but then of course. Those narratives and those those um, findings can then be used or co-opted by the nation state or, as you say, um, people in in certain positions of power. So that is always going to be a danger. Um, whether you're talking about restitution or or any type of archaeological or art historical research, I mean, for me, it's it's always why I've, I've been trying to think of how do you bring it back to the local and how do you how do you sort of how do you try and counter that with with local epistemologies and working with local communities? And um, of course, we've had that question about how do you identify who's the local community and so on and so forth. But um, you could also involve diaspora communities, right? So, so Stephen, there's, there's a question directly on that to you, actually. Should we focus on communities or place of origin? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a good question. But I think you know, in order to mitigate, I think that's how we would do it. And um, of course, again, the local community may not be the same community as um, as as was 
uh, the one there before, but in, in many other times it, it is. So, so again, it's 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 a tricky one. Um, yeah, I mean, and again, a lot of the times things get repatriated to the capital. Um, so in, in Thailand as well, they have this they have this term where they they say, you know, we were never colonized, but we have internal colonization, as in we have the Bangkok as the center, and and then the local communities in in the regional areas. Um, are still, you know, um, are still made, you know, sort of under that influence. But again, uh, yeah, there's been a, a strong local museum movement that's built up in Thailand over the past 20 years, a very grassroots NGO-based local museum, local heritage movements um, that are very powerful now and actually have driven a lot of the debate around restitution. Um, and so again, there's these are ways if we can encourage that and we can mitigate against um, the, the political aspects of it. And we can also maybe start to address the question that was asked as in, oh. you know, who, yeah. So um, we you, should Stephen. be supporting thank those movements. All right, well, thank you, Stephen. I'm going to sh a final question to Naman. Naman, there is a, a two-part question that somebody poses, which I think would be perfect for you. If we consider the role of the museum, as many say, is to increasingly, increasingly help protect the global heritage and raise awareness of cultural destruction, how can they do this while simultaneously holding looted collections? How do we bring those two elements together? Your final. I wrote a line in an article last year, which said, even infamy is better than irrelevance. Well, that, that's something we should remember. <laughs> and I think, honestly, I mean, the museum is getting more tours with people who talk about its loot. And they come to the museum to see the, see the museum. It's bringing in visitors to the museum to see the loot and to hear the narrative of how the looting happened and what happened about these objects. And somewhere in the middle of all of this, somebody is going to be inspired by the object to be able to do this. And I think may come and become an art historian one day. But I think there is, there is this, there are narratives that are going to come up for each generation that are going to mobilize these objects and make them relevant for their communities. And I think uh, that's what we need to remember. The museum should not feel threatened. The museum is the keeper of these stories as much as it is the keeper of the object. It is the keeper of the narratives and the curatorial stories that go along with these objects that mobilize them and make them relevant for the public and not just the object itself. But ultimately the object has to be kept safe enough and conserved scientifically enough so that it can be mobilized to tell the next generation's important stories. Today, we are talking about restitution and the reparations of colonial wrongs. But let's not lose sight of the fact that our descendants are going to hold us accountable for not doing enough for the climate, for instance. And they're going to look into these very objects and these very museums to tell histories of climate change rather than telling histories of decolonization. Right. They're going to use these objects for different sets of narratives, which are going to be important for them in that generation. And I think that's that's something that we need to be humble enough to recognize. I think you're very right in raising the point that museums preserve historical evidence of the ways in which religion and culture were practiced in previous times. But this also makes museums extremely vulnerable as they may demonstrate a past which is very different from the way in which traditions and religions are perceived today. And coming from a country where the perceived ideas of tradition outweigh the facts of history, <laughs> museums are often the only place which maintain that evidence, safeguarding it for the next generation to be able to tell that story or another version of that story. And over this past 10, 15 years, this, this um, revelation of the difference between past and present has led to very serious attacks on museums and heritage sites all over the world. For example, Tunisia, Syria, India faces its own vulnerabilities. And I think we need to, alongside repatriation, honestly think about how we are safeguarding these institutions that are going to house this evidence. 
because they are very vulnerable to attack from all sides. And to grant them the autonomy and security that they require is going to have to be the job of this global commons if they really want that. The, uh, I want to end there because it's a powerful voice in the moment. And it's a powerful voice in part because of your ideas and your thought processes. But it's also a powerful voice because you're located in the South. You're located right. in, Af in India. And it seems to me, as somebody who's recently moved to London, I'm quite struck by the unnuanced character of this debate. And the fact that somebody from the South is arguing for what I would imagine is a radical pragmatism, radical, yes, we need to correct the tragedies of our past, but we need to do this in a pragmatic way. We need to do it in a thoughtful way. We need to do it in a way that protects this as a heritage for the collective of humanity itself. And we need more nuance come to and who gets returned, who decides, what gets returned, repatriated, the obligations of the host country, the obligations of the, of the new host. Uh, the, I love the idea that you drawn from, uh, drew from the Japanese experience where the national treasures go back to the museums of the land, but there is enough out there that doesn't make this a zero sum game. And so what I think all of this is suggesting at the end is we need a far more nuanced conversation in the public discourse around repatriation in the West than is currently the case. And in part, because it's driven too much by politicians and too little by scholars, <laughs> activists, uh, uh, th thoughtful, cultural uh, uh, colleagues who feel both the importance of return, of correcting the histories of our past, but recognizing that we're trying to build a common future. And I think that the messaging from both of you actually highlights that. So I want to say thank you, Naman. I thank know you. it's very, very late in Delhi. I want to thank you, Stephen, for all of the time that you've taken. And if there's a message that I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from both of you is let's have a more complex debate, a more nuanced debate, one that heals the divisions of our past, but that builds a global common future. I'll stop there. Thank you very, very, very much. Well, thank you, Stephen, and thank you very much, Adam. Thank yes. you, Adam. Thank you. No, it was a real pleasure. Thank you.